The Paris Agreement was a watershed in the climate negotiations. Countries agreed to the essential framework for the international effort to address climate change. Yet agreement in Paris also underlined the difficulties in using the processes of international negotiation to bring about an unprecedented worldwide revolution in energy production and usage. The impressive policy goals and intentions of Paris were easy to agree on. The work comes now in actually meeting those agreements. Climate change is a cumulative problem. The more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that are released and build up in the atmosphere, the greater the risk of warming, which comes with costly and potentially catastrophic impacts. To keep to a relatively safe level of warming, it is essential that countries begin to cut emissions as soon as possible. While climate change mitigation requires real investments and policy measures, in stark contrast, the international climate negotiation process is entirely voluntary. Designed this way, in order to try and bring all countries to the table, the process has been very successful in establishing a shared objective and system of rules and guidelines. Yet, this flexibility also makes it more difficult to increase or even reduce the stringency of climate policies. Indeed, after years of negotiation, the flagship climate agreement's voluntary targets are insufficient in terms of emission reductions to provide a reasonable chance of avoiding dangerous climate change. As concerns grow about the human impact on the Earth, this work aims to present and outline some key international decisions concerning global climate held in the second semester of 2015. It also aims to portray some emerging trends these decisions indicate. The international regime governing climatic issues will be analysed in part as a fragmented governance model. The results indicate both expressions of this model and the influence of other actors within the international system. The structure of the work begins with an introduction that leads to a development of climatic governance and it highlights the current state of the debate on this topic. After that, the paper presents some key moments of the Global Climate Change Summit of 2015, such as the Bonn Intergovernmental Climate Conference, the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals and La Terre Notre Avenir. The paper then presents an analysis of the emerging trends for global weather governance and finally, it provides some conclusive considerations. The fight against climate change and the occurrence of phenomena related to it have proved to be crucial issues for the Earth's future. The world has long sought different strategies to lower levels of damage and wear and to mitigate the climate impact while driving for development, well-being and improved quality of life for mankind. On several occasions, international demonstrations throughout the 20th century sought to regulate the means by which humans should deal with the complex issue of the environment. In order to place the current summit in a historical perspective, one must first understand the origins of the global interest in addressing climate change. Driven by concern that man-made global warming would drive millions of species to extinction and negatively affect current and future generations of people by causing food production and agricultural problems, a team of scientists established a climate science centre in October 2000. The centre's work concluded that addressing the problem would require major changes in public policy. In an effort to raise the attention of world government leaders to the seriousness of the problem and to call for legally binding international agreements to address the issue, a series of global summits were organised by various countries. The first of such conferences took place in Kyoto in 1997 held in a city so historically prominent that an entire millennium is named after it. The protocol, the first international commitment to reduce carbon emissions, was signed in 1998. The agreement called for a sequence of commitment periods, with the first commitment period being due to end at the end of 2012. The protocol became effective after its ratification by Japan in February 2005, 90 days after at least 55 parties to the convention accounting for an estimated 55% of the total global carbon dioxide emissions, had ratified it. It is now in its third commitment period, issued on December 8, 2012, and it is assumed that the commitments of the language of the protocol in 2020 should be replaced in its entirety, or at least the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions processes enhanced in a second period after 2020.
The international community has been thinking and talking about climate change for over a century. Scientists first began discussing how burning fossil fuels might lead to atmospheric changes in 1896 in Sweden. When diplomacy discussions on the issue began to take place during the mid-1950s, some early observers believed the well-ordered system of science diplomacy could use its close-knit structure of national meteorological offices and international research programs to make quick progress on the matter. But the failure of a 1959 summit of national meteorological services to draft a joint research plan made clear that governments wouldn't be able to set aside their divergent interests to collaborate on the climate issue. For the next 30 years, the scientific community pressed for international action while foreign ministers and development agencies dismissed the problem in their rush for population control or the space race, or both. The issue of climate change first reached the agenda of the United Nations and its diplomatic forums at the end of the 1970s, when delegates from small island states and international experts tried to draw the world's attention to this scientific concept of a running change in the environment. Upon the conclusion of agreements that controlled emissions of the ozone-depleting chlorofluorocarbons in 1986, Hopes were high in the UN system that the world community would be able to hastily draft and approve a carbon dioxide convention as well. But subsequent attempts to discuss the substance of the plan at the individual nation-state level led to a deadlock that persisted for over a year. Large northern countries had difficulty adjusting to the idea that their energy-intensive lifestyle was leading to the creation of an unstable global climate system that would likely be expensive to fix. At a 1988 meeting of environment ministers during their annual gathering, it became clear that discussion of the science was over. It was time to create a legally binding plan to reduce human contribution to climate change. Key moments from global climate summits. Nations and businesses announced deeper emissions cuts. More than 110 countries, including US rivals China and Russia, emerged Thursday from the climate summit in Glasgow with a deal to reduce methane emissions, which the White House called the strongest global action on the dangerous greenhouse gas to date. Meanwhile, 5,000 companies and investors, including several top US banks and ExxonMobil, pledged to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. U.S.-China Statement on Climate Cooperation. The statement is strong on the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with a section and a joint working group on coal. The statement tries to reconcile China's recent pledge to rely on coal less in the coming years with the U.S. demand that it not build any new coal power plants. Here's the pledge on coal, which is the most tangible of the cooperative spirit detailed in the overall statement. India and the U.S. Partners in the Great Climate Fight. India and the US discussed and agreed to work closely together to support accelerated global development, deployment, and equitable accessibility of technologies for net zero emissions, including renewables, energy storage, energy efficiency, sustainable mobility, advanced vehicles, and alternative fuels. The objective is to bridge the gap between the global north and global south in the transition. They also focus on the just transition to ensure no one is left behind. Paris Agreement 2015 The Paris Agreement is the document adopted in December 2015 after years of negotiations that legally binds the signatory countries to control the increase in the global average temperature and limit the emissions of greenhouse gases. One of the most important achievements of the Paris Agreement is the commitment made by several countries to contribute to the Green Climate Fund. The fund will collect approximately $100 billion by 2020 to adapt the most vulnerable countries to the effects of climate change such as floods and storms and finance development projects in a sustainable way slowly decreasing the use of fossil fuels. Today, despite having the Paris Agreement, international society is still faced with the challenge of reducing emissions, investing in renewable energies and seeking new ways to adapt to the effects of climate change. The agreement aims to promote this transformation and encourage the development of mechanisms to reduce emissions in such a way as to not harm the poorest and most affected people, as well as preventing the situation from becoming irreversible. 
The international community now has the means and the financial and technological resources necessary to reverse the worsening of the Earth's temperature. With this agreement, effective measures will be taken and in the next few years, several countries will begin to take the necessary steps. The idea of zero energy and zero carbon building policies is to foster advances in building hardware allowing the information provided at the building design and purchase point to predict building zero energy and zero carbon emissions performance. Retrofit policies instead are flexible tools as they can be tailored to specific regions and have enormous near-term potential for mitigating the extent and impacts of adverse economic, social and health implications of climate change. There is huge policy potential for state-local joint efforts provided there is coordinated state-local political commitment to succeed. This can result in a reduction of baseload energy demand as well as reductions in energy demand from the use of electricity for heating water, space heating and space cooling. Local climate policy officials signal in state climate action planning about partnerships and political collaborations also identified in successful state-local combination policy which is necessary for overcoming energy efficiency, federal regulatory considerations and baseload energy demand. States are also known to have bonded with local governments differently, whereas all four US states provide financial assistance as part of their state-local methodology, only California does so, distinguishing four different political jurisdictions. In addition, not-for-profit institutions have been established by public and private funding partners to serve as energy efficiency technical support, measurement, implementation and standards pilots for non-residential, zero energy special purpose and lead buildings. The ultimate economic question concerns the validity of an energy constraint paradigm. Business exists in social practice where property accumulation proceeds through and despite coordinated energy use benchmarks. This characteristic gave rise to economic theories of absolute cost, price and supply behaviours over time, as well as the convergence of labour productivities over space. Climate policy need not threaten norms of social organisation or hierarchical expectations, just typical network form institutional practices, carbon dioxide taxes, generalise other recent popular tax reform suggestions, transforming economies, flaunting latent productivity convergence into carbon constrained technologies where real alternative resource costs eventually rise with neglect of timing. Regarding future payoffs, prospective uncertainty of inherent quantity rationing underperforms bequeath prospects through potential natural resources. Capital accumulation thresholds precede economic transition from exhaustible mineral resource endowment, complying with bequeathed limits of permanent structure, into the promised sustainable existence of a net zero carbon dioxide economy. Economic sustainability criteria would concentrate on passage through bequeathed geological formations, jeopardizing climate transformation. Late emergent concerns of peak carbon dioxide reflect lags in the application of emissions tax incentives. Experience from exhaustible mineral resource analysis frames views about non-identity problems. Intergenerational equity and climate change incentives arise from underlying resource scarcity facing potential pollution consequences. Building on the positive momentum from the Global Climate Summit, leaders in both the public and private sectors are now galvanized to respond more directly to the urgent challenge of climate change by putting technology innovation and leadership into action. The convergence of a clear and pressing environmental need, broad availability of enabling technologies and the experience of companies large and small working on sustainable practices puts the industry in a unique position to make bold steps forward. With timely investment in new and innovative solutions, companies will create new business opportunities, drive greater energy efficiency, spur innovation in developing countries that are poised to lead major population centres, and improve the health and living conditions of citizens around the world. A re-energised retail market will play an extremely important role in catalyzing the early use and acceptance of new technologies, spurring demand growth and economies of scale that in turn can accelerate time to market and reduce technology risks associated with longer-term blue-sky research. 
improved regulatory and technical standards along with broadly aligned market policies create a regulatory climate where the industry can plan for the future with confidence in its potential success. Consistent, high-quality measurement, verification and certification programs can provide additional credentials and assurance that the products will perform as promised. Done well, these programs can lead to broad recognition and acceptance of the approach to satisfy the growing interest of consumers, manufacturers and governments in meeting committed technology policy goals. When combined with a longer-term program to increase public awareness and market demand, the sector can tap into the full potential of energy efficiency and help create the future of clean, reliable and affordable energy around the world. One of the most prominent distinctions between the run-up to Copenhagen and Copenhagen itself was the fact that the summit exhibited how much the diplomatic process has caught up with new development and ingenuity-driven strategies to combat climate change. As we argue here, the pace and breathtaking potential of emerging technologies and innovations were among the less reported but most exciting characteristics of the summit. First, and rather paradoxically, the proliferation of the world economy and the large level of commitments announced by various nations and cities during the summit can, in part, be traced back to the fact that decoupling activities from greenhouse gas emissions does not have to come at the expense of growth anymore. Advances in electric vehicles and other cleaner energy conversion technologies, innovations in the recycling of energy in industrial processes, large-scale commercialization of electricity, the increasing interest in a new breed of cheap and ultra-clean renewable devices, including waste-derived biofuels, hydrogen and clean tech oriented materials were but a few of the great news delivered by the global citizens through the private sector arms of the clean revolution. The climate crisis is real and the time to act is now. Join the global movement by learning how the world's leaders are taking steps to combat climate change. Watch the video, stay informed and share it with others to spread awareness. Together, we can make a difference for the planet. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more updates on how we can protect our future.